everyone, and welcome to this Federal Society virtual event. My name is Emily Manning, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups with the Federal Society. Today, we're excited to host a discussion titled Antitrust Agencies Scrutiny of Labor. We're joined today by Andrew Finch, Bruce Hoffman, Dan Gilman, Maureen Olhausen, Jim Peretti, Professor Marshall Steinbaum, and our moderator today is Svetlana Gons, partner at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher and also co-chair of the Federal Society's Corporation Securities and Antitrust Practice Group Executive Committee. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federal Society. With that, thank you for joining us today. And Svetlana, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this discussion on um, antitrust and labor issue, which has been all the rage in the papers lately. So we are happy to provide you this timely and important content. Um, as most have seen, the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division have put labor issues at the center of antitrust enforcement and policymaking. The agencies are closely examining um, companies hiring, recruitment, non-compete, and employee classification and compensation policies. They've also recently amended their merger guidelines and HSR uh, rules to look more into labor and workforce practices. Um, the FTC in particular has entered into agreements with the uh, National Labor Relations Board and Department of Labor to share investigatory files and personnel and other intelligence, um, and may soon issue its first uh, competition rule um, to ban non-compete provisions and employment contracts. So this panel will explore all of these developments and discuss whether these developments are new or not and how they will impact um, antitrust and labor issues going forward. So I will not um, go into detail with respect to our panelists' bios. You could get them online. Um, so I will just briefly uh, introduce the panelists and their former titles, which are probably most relevant for, for today's discussion. Um, so first we have Andrew Finch. He's a partner at Paul Weiss. He's the former principal deputy assistant attorney general and the acting assistant attorney general at the DOJ's antitrust division. Then we have D. Bruce Hoffman. He's a partner at Cleary uh, and former director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. Dan Gilman, he's a senior scholar of competition policy at the International Center for Law and Economics. He previously served in the Division of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission, among other roles. Maureen Olhausen, she is a partner at Wilson, Sincini, Goodrich, and Rosati. She is the former acting chair of the FTC and an FTC commissioner. We have James Peretti, he's a shareholder at Littler Mendelssohn, and he's a former chief of staff and senior counsel at the EEOC. And Professor Marshall Steinbaum, he's the assistant professor of economics at the Utah uh, University, senior fellow in higher education, and also has a PhD in economics uh, from the University of Chicago and has written extensively on the issue of labor and antitrust law. So thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to turn the first question over to Andrew, if you could just explain generally on where we are in the area of labor issues in the non-merger arena at the antitrust agencies. How are the antitrust agencies looking at labor issues um, in the conduct world? Thanks, Svetlana. Um... I'll begin by thanking the, you and the Federal Society and all my panelists. I think this is a very timely uh, topic and a good idea to do a panel because we're sort of at, I think, a high watermark for enforcement in, in labor antitrust issues. It's not really a, an entirely new area of enforcement for this administration. Uh, it's an area of increased emphasis and really a more comprehensive approach than I think we've ever seen before. Enforcement in this area, modern enforcement, I would say, really goes back to 2010, which was when the Justice Department entered into a settlement with six tech companies uh, that had been uh, 
parties to an agreement not to cold call each other's employees or what people now talk talk about as a non-solicitation type of agreement. Uh, that was a civil settlement and was followed uh, in 2016 at the end of the Obama administration by a joint statement by the Federal Trade Commission and the uh, Justice Department uh, that uh, gave guidance to HR professionals. And that guidance had a, a statement that caught a lot of people's attention because it said that the DOJ may prosecute no poach type agreements criminally. And so that came right at the end of the Obama administration. That policy actually carried forward in, in through the, the Trump administration. And um, the, the Trump administration did uh, initiate multiple no poach investigations. Uh, the uh, principal deputy in 2018 gave a speech and said that this was going to be uh, an area of focus and that uh, no poach agreements could be prosecuted as per se unlawful criminal violations of the Sherman Act. Um, and in fact, the, the Justice Department did bring some charges uh, during the, the Trump administration, uh, but it really picked up uh, at, under the Biden administration. President Biden issued an executive order uh, talking about uh, encouraging the FTC, among other things, to focus on on non-competes, which it did. And I'm sure we'll get into that. The Justice Department continued to pursue uh, criminal investigations and prosecutions. It didn't quite have the success I think it had hoped for. And we may get into maybe what some of the reasons were for that. And uh, and then I'll just touch on it uh, even more recently and putting aside the merger guidelines, which talk about this in merger review. Um, Commissioner Bedoya gave a speech just last week talking about whether or not uh, employee misclassification could be a basis for an unfair uh, method of competition uh, under the FTC Act. The idea being that if one employer misclassifies its employees as independent contractors and another doesn't, that might you know, create a disparity in costs and, for example, give one employer an unfair advantage in bidding for work. So that's also an interesting development. So in many ways, I'll just Finish by saying um, it's sort of been like a hockey stick. I think the you know enforcement was 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 ramping up at least in criminal enforcement, and there were some civil settlements. But now it's really expanded to be much more comprehensive. So could I just add, um, you know, there have been other sorts of efforts that can be construed as um, interest in labor issues. Um, NC Dental, when it got to the Supreme Court, was about uh, the state action doctrine, but the underlying enforcement matter had to do with scope of practice restrictions, who could deliver some you know, very safe services, South Carolina dentistry also, and of course, Maureen Olhausen really uh, spearheaded a lot of um, advocacy efforts uh, on labor restrictions and FTC staff, policy staff, and also Bureau of Economic staff had done research on such things. So they're sort of diverse things not the same kinds of efforts we're seeing now and certainly not the same emphasis, but there are different kinds of roots. Good point. It's a very good point. Yeah, th thanks, Dan. Yes, when I was the acting chair, one of my efforts was uh, what we call the Economic Liberty Task Force to really look at occupational licensing restrictions and how they were keeping out um, kind of uh, innovators and, uh, you know, uh, people on the just stepping on the first rung of the economic ladder uh, from entering a, you know, a whole host of different um, job categories. And a big impact also on um, military spouses as they moved around and having to get relicensed in every state and the difficulties that created and actually had impacts on um, readiness in the military because that was one of the reasons people were leaving the military was that uh, challenge for their spouses. So um, yeah, it's a... It's not a, a totally new topic. It, I think, has some new flavors and some new emphasis. So, Maureen or or anyone for the panel, like, what would you say are the key differences between how previous administrations have viewed labor issues and how this administration is viewing it? How what are the key differences? Well, maybe maybe I'll jump in on the merger the merger point there. So, um, previously, though. Um, I think, you know, Andrew talked about 
uh, conduct matters um, and um, competition advocacy where you couldn't really bring an enforcement action or, or maybe you could against the state board uh, if they were made up of um, competitors in the marketplace. Uh, but I think there's been a, a little less of a focus on labor issues in the, in the merger space. And that's one of the things that we're seeing here. Now, that's not a totally new concept. I mean, we called it like monopsony power, right? The power buyer. Kind of kind of issue, and there have been cases brought about you know a merger having an impact um, on that side of the market, monopsony side of the market. There was a private one involving um, fish, actually, um, you know, fishermen selling fish uh, to um, fish processors. Uh, the Simon and Schuster case that you know focused, I think, on the the labor, you know, the the creators and and their um, uh, the, the impact on them of, of that proposed merger. Uh, and then we're seeing it, um, you know, I, I think emphasized quite quite a bit more in the merger, in the merger space. So uh, for example, um, Chair Khan and Commissioner um, uh, Slaughter had a, a separate statement in the lifespan case saying, well, we would have supported um, also bringing this as a, you know, an impact on the, I think, nurses on, on, on their uh, ability to, to get um, hired uh, or change shops in the market. Um, and so now in the merger guidelines, we have a whole section um, that, that discusses this. I think it's um, guideline 10. Um, and I think one of the real changes there is having this in the guidelines as a particular factor uh, that the agencies are looking at and with statements along the lines of saying labor markets frequently have characteristics that exacerbate the um, uh, the effects of a merger between competing employers. I, I don't think um, you know we've seen anything like that previously in, in a merger contest. I think there's some question about whether that <laughs> assertion is true, um, uh, but uh, it's certainly an area of em emphasis. And we saw it also in the White House, a statement surrounding the release of the, the proposed merger guidelines last year. Uh, and then interestingly, we're also seeing it in the HSR rule change. So the, the HSR proposed rule about you know, the information that the agencies collect when they're reviewing a merger now have um, proposed additional collection on issues such as non-competes, um, on um, uh, commuting zones for, for workers, on worker classification issues, um, not quite the same as what Commissioner Bedoya was talking about, but uh, like looking at commuting zones, where do workers you know, commute, commute from? Um, it'd be interesting uh, to see if they get included in a final rule, whether that's a basis for challenging if it goes beyond the authorization of the um, HSR Act, right? <laughs> whether non-competes is really something the HSR Act is concerned about, even if there was a, a different you know, area of concern in that. So, so I think that you know, trying to really not just emphasize it in mergers, but almost argue that is a primary effect or a primary competitive concern for mergers is really, I think, an unusual um, and new focus that uh, the current administration has. Yeah, can, I, can I add a quick point or two on that? Um, I think that's absolutely right. I, I will say there have been some merger investigations that involve elements of labor. So I, I actually distinctly remember being yelled at uh, while I was director of the Bureau of Competition um, at, on a panel by a private practitioner because we had started including specifications in the second request asking about labor overlaps. Uh, and the question posed to me was, quote, unquote, are you insane? Um, so we had, we had started asking about that, but it certainly didn't get the focus it's getting today. Secondly, uh, to add to the cases that that Maureen was listing, which you know are, are actually quite a few when you sum them all up, the one that comes to mind for me was I think it was Griffles, uh, where the it was labor, but you know you, you either view, view it as labor or supply a commodity, but it was an obsy case. The, of course, the market involved was near and dear to most college students. It was supplying blood plasma. Uh, which in college towns is a big source of income. You know, you go out drinking the night before and then you go uh, sell some of your blood plasma to get money to go. Next night. Um, and, and there was absolutely actually a monopsony concern in the market for purchasing blood plasma from, I guess, mostly uh, hangover ridden college students. Can I um, just 
to add a couple little things. Um, one is with the HSR rules, some of the information they're asking for is a little odd, right? So, so labor violations, OSHA violations going back five years from all filing parties. I mean, if, if you go to labor and go to the OSHA website and, and look, uh, you will see that OSHA violations are heavy, heavily concentrated in not concentrated industries. Doesn't mean you can't have antitrust issues, but they don't look like a good signal of anything that you would look at in a merger investigation. Um, the stuff about um, the commuting zones and the six digit occupational codes, I mean, one is not exactly a geographic market, the other is not, <laughs> not a, a, a labor market in antitrust terms. And, you know, firms don't necessarily keep this information in this form in the ordinary course. So, I, 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 I mean, what they're going to do with it is unclear. It, it could be rather costly to gather. Uh, just quickly, I think there's a looming problem here that, that goes from HSR screening all the way through in the merger case, which is that, um, you know, if you're talking about a fileable merger, maybe in the manufacturing sector, all kinds of sectors, um, right? You, you may have multiple product markets. You may have scores or even hundreds of labor markets implicated. And so if you take the single market theory, both literally and seriously, um, you could get a lot of cross-cutting cases where you're trading, you know, effects in one labor market against another labor market, effects in uh, a labor market against a much larger uh, product market with many more consumers. And, you know, I, I don't have a nice, neat solution to that, but the guidelines give us no help in sort of how to order or, or sort these things. I think in sort of the price and terms fixing things and the rent seeking and the exclusionary conduct, you're much less likely to get these kinds of conflicts, right? I mean, uh, um, so <laughs> uh, you can have sort of clean effects, maybe harms in a labor market, but no obvious uh, trade-offs um, uh, downstream or even laterally. Um, I don't know that there's, that this has been sorted out at all. Yeah, and actually, Dan, I, I should have mentioned uh, talking about the merger guidelines and then switching to the HSR is the merger guidelines are only going to apply to the very, very small percentage of mergers that get you know, uh, a deeper inquiry. So Bruce, when you mentioned asking about this in a separate request, you know, that's a tiny, tiny fraction of the mergers that are filed, that are notified every year. Um, but um, collecting this in the HSR uh, means every deal, every deal over the threshold, which I think now is like slightly over $120 million. Uh, dollars. So it's almost like a presumption that it's worth collecting this information for every single transaction over the threshold in the U.S. Um, because the parties are going to have to supply that information now, which I think is, um, you know, uh, inter interesting and possibly a, a, a very vast over collection of information that is very, very unlikely to identify any competitive issue in, in most mergers. So for the audience members who may not be familiar, what is the status of the HSR rule changes? Are those final? Or are those still pending? What What's the status just for the audience? Right. So they were put out for comment and the agencies received the comments um, and now they are reviewing those comments. Um, but it is, um, you know, possible, possibly this year, the agents, the uh, agencies will put out a final rule that could go in effect as early as 30 days after the rule is issued. So it's really sort of looming um, that this these changes could be, um, you know, uh, an, a new obligation uh, very soon. There is a question in the in the Q&A, so I just wanted to be mindful of that. Um, since human labor is not an article of commerce under 15 U.S.C. 17, what is the source of authority for the FTC's regulation of labor markets? 
who wants to take that? I'm happy to take a quick shot and then defer to anybody else. But number one, that particular statutory provision was designed to protect labor unions. It's a statutory labor exemption. It's because though this was not the intent when the antitrust laws were enacted, some of the first uses to which they were put were going after labor unions. Uh, so Congress had to step in and fix that problem. Um, secondly, I don't think anything we're talking about, with the possible exception of the um, rulemaking on non-competes, is what I would call direct regulation by the FTC of labor. Instead, it's how you think about <clears throat> purchasing and selling labor and effects on that in the context of enforcing the antitrust laws in mergers and acquisitions or in other areas. So just as the FTC, when it's looking at a merger for can manufacturing, for example, or maybe the DOJ, I don't know, whoever, whenever, whenever somebody's looking at a merger for can manufacturing, you're not regulating cans. Uh, I would say that looking at uh, the effects of a merger on labor probably wouldn't be viewed as regulating labor directly. Those are my sort of off the cuff reactions to that. Yeah. And I, I think that actually ties into the point we we're making earlier, just sort of what is different now than seems to be different then. Uh, and certainly from my perspective, I think with res the, the non-compete uh, proposed rule in particular, it's really the first time I've seen that they're, they're going to regulate on a granular level. They are going to each individual employee rather than the effect on the labor market or a business to business transaction. And I think that's what sort of raised everybody's heads. If in fact they have even the authority to do that, and we can talk about that, I think there's a strong argument that they don't have the authority for that rule, uh, irrespective of the fact that it's relating to labor. Right, so yeah, we could talk about that uh, in a bit. I wanted to turn to Marshall, um, Professor Steinbaum for, for a moment, to talk a little bit about the evidence and the research that the antitrust agencies are pointing to. I know you've done a, a lot of the research um, and familiar with it, um, research suggesting that there is too much power over uh, the workforce. The Treasury Department report recently stated that the review of credible academic studies shows that there has been an increase in market power for employers that has led to a roughly 20% decrease in wages relative to the level in a fully competitive market. Can you discuss some of this research and, and why that why that means that the FTC and DOD should be looking at, at labor issues in the antitrust through the antitrust lens? Sure. Um, so I think there's very strong reasons underlying the policy shifts that we've been talking about on this in this discussion uh, so far. And I thought the Treasury report that you just referred to did a very good job of wrapping all of that evidence together in, in one place in a, in a comprehensive way. I mean, I'll just say it's been a decade since I left my PhD uh, program at the University of Chicago, and there's been basically a sea change in, la in labor economics uh, since then relative to what I was taught, namely that the canonical model of how the labor market works is perfect competition. Um, you know, you'll get laughed out of the room in any seminar on labor economics for put, uh, putting forward such a model uh, these days, and that's for very good reason. I mean, there's uh, a, a longstanding evidence about the effect of the minimum wage not or increase in the minimum wage not leading to a reduction in employment that's consistent with a model of labor market power, not consistent with a model of uh, perfect competition. Um, we've got direct measures of marginal product of labor and of the wages that workers are actually paid, and you can show that uh, wages less than the marginal product. Um, we've got evidence of increased interfirm earnings inequality. So in a perfectly competitive labor market, basically, no matter uh, the skills or, or characteristics of a given worker, they should be making the same uh, earning, uh, wage no matter which firm they work for in that market. And that is uh, you know, pretty demonstrably falsified by uh, 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 investigations into the phenomenon of interfirm earnings inequality. Um, so, you know, to sort of speak to a point that, that Maureen dropped off uh, earlier in this conversation, you know, I think the uh, uh, consensus among labor economics is that it is actually true that frequently labor markets are defined by uh, imperfect competition and, and some degree of market power on the part of employers. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, I've been speaking about the evidence coming from the uh, labor economic side, even the industrial organization economists 
you know, who are, are typically more involved in the antitrust policy making and enforcement um, have now, you know, I, I like to think of I, IO economists as being uh, motivated by a T-shirt that I used to see people wearing at the University of Chicago, which was, okay, I understand how it works in practice. How does it work in theory? Um, IO economists tend to care more about economic theory than uh, uh, empirical evidence. And yet, you know, now there's plenty of uh, uh, sort of theoretically grounded in traditional IO type methodologies um, regarding imperfect labor market type competition. So I'm referring to differentiated products, uh, discrete choice type models, um, uh, uh, estimated on uh, labor market data and, and job postings and applications, uh, also the traditional sort of production function estimation approach um, from industrial industrial organization where you're measuring the marginal cost and then seeing what the wage is in comparison to that. Um, you know, we've got uh, papers doing that and, and showing that labor market power has risen over time. So, you know, I think, you know, kind of across the spectrum of economics research, there's really no doubt about this question anymore. Um, that raises the second part of your, or that leads to the second part of your question, which is why is it having so much of an effect on policy? It's not just a sort of academic trend trend or development in the literature. I mean, those happen all the time and they don't all uh, sort of feed through to uh, the policy world. So the question is, why is this one uh, uh, different in this respect? Um, and my interpreter, so your question sort of prompts me to, to consider, you know, the process by which uh, intellectual developments affect policy more broadly. You know, I think it's because the uh, idea that employers systematically exercise power in the labor market is just flatly inconsistent with a lot of the um, uh, received wisdom in antitrust enforcement with respect to uh, uh, the kind of disposition of the laws vis-a-vis -vis certain practices or types of mergers. So what do I mean by that? If you think about horizontal mergers, the basic uh, um, policy analysis, so to speak, is there's the potential for exercising market power in the output market by raising price. There's also the potential for uh, efficiencies from a horizontal merger and the basic uh, uh, practice in horizontal merger enforcement would be to weigh the anti-competitive effect in the output market vis-a-vis -vis, uh, pricing power against those efficiencies. Well, if the labor market is systematically uh, uncompetitive, those are what we've been calling efficiencies all these years are actually anti-competitive exercises of market power in the labor market. So that means both forces that you're weighing against each other in a horizontal merger actually go in the same direction. And therefore, the correct legal uh, analysis for horizontal mergers is a per se rule against them, not uh, basically quasi rule of reason with a structural presumption, is, which is the um, uh, disposition of enforcement now. Uh, thinking also about my work is more uh, oriented towards vertical restraints and the exercise of market power across the boundary of the firm and into uh, different markets. You know, there I, I would refer to the kind of uh, 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 way this is um, conceptualized by my my colleague Sanjuk Paul that different areas of law draw different boundaries of the firm, different notional boundaries of the firm. So in antitrust, we typically have had lax enforcement or no enforcement against vertical restraints. The implication is basically that the firm has a wide boundary, that uh, a lead firm can tell a subordinate firm formally, uh, at least legally speaking, an independent contractor uh, what to do, and that's economically efficient. I see the sort of intellectual lineage of that idea stemming from the Cosian theory of the boundaries of the firm that um, uh, basically horizontal or uh, vertical control is a mechanism for productive efficiency. Um, whereas if the labor market's uncompetitive, you can think of these subordinate uh, economic actors as basically being coerced. That's the, the thrust of the non-compete rule. Um, and consequently, that idea that uh, ex exercising this control across the boundaries of the firm, that's a pro-competitive because it's productively efficient, you know, that idea gets drawn into severe questions. And so this leads to uh, sea change in our disposition towards vertical restraints rather than a rule of reason, which is how they're considered now, which is you know pretty weakly enforced if, if at all. That's as a per se rule against vertical restraints, basically. If you're outside the boundary of the firm, you can't be told what to do under any circumstances. And then finally, I would say this idea that labor markets are systematically uncompetitive you know, from an economic perspective, justify something like what Bruce referred to, the labor exemption, that is to say the the uh, exemption from liability under Section 1 and equivalent statutes uh, with respect to uh, bona fide labor unions. You know, the basic idea is basically horizontal or, uh, uh, coordination on the part of workers can be pro-competitive if they're otherwise at a uh, uh, disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis market power. 
aside from the labor, the statutory labor exemption itself, and, I, and that area of law, we have basically a per se rule against uh, horizontal coordination. And so the implication here is that should actually be a rule of reason. That's the one that's really up for uh, a case by case analysis. So things like the uh, occupational licensing that uh, Maureen was focused on uh, in her tenure at the um, FTC, you know, that could be anti competitive. I'm not saying it never is, but that should really be where we have uh, uh, the kind of back and forth that is baked into the world of reason. So we'll go ahead. I'm no, go happy. ahead, Bruce. Yeah, so a, a couple of thoughts on the data, right? Um, one, I don't doubt the basic proposition that increased market power or in the form of increased concentration, increased concentration among employers can have monopsonistic effects on labor supply. I think that that's actually rudimentary. It makes complete sense. And I think it's empirically demonstrable. Um, but I think there's a number of other points or a number of other things bound up in what Professor Marshall said that I think, Professor Stein, oh, sorry, Marshall, um, that, we, that bear a little bit of discussion. One, perfect competition, I think, is not what most people would say characterizes labor markets today. But that doesn't mean that labor markets are monopsonistic, right? And, and there's a wide gap between the true monopsony and perfect competition, and almost all markets operate at some point in between those, which means in general, we don't draw bright line rules based on the concept that they're pure monopsonies, pure monopolies, or perfectly competitive. We look instead at what's actually going on in terms of how firms are interacting. Um, second, in terms of what the empirical research shows, I mean, you can dig into this in a, in a lot of detail. We could do an entire panel on it, but just looking, if you just look through the treasury report, it talks about a number of studies, which I'm reasonably familiar with independently. And there are conclusions from those studies that are worth pointing out. You know, one, it looks at a study about merger effects on wages, right? And that, that particular study involved hospital markets. It's one of the few that actually found a direct link, direct effect between mergers and, and wages. But it, it had two findings that are think, I think are quite important in this context. One was that the effects of the price reductions were limited to highly specialized jobs, right? And that there were not price effects for less specialized jobs. So that's that suggests that market concentration in employment is going to vary significantly based on the types of jobs you're talking about, which of course makes sense, right? If I'm doing something at a hospital that I could also do at a restaurant, then I'm not that worried about a hospital merger. But if I'm a doctor or a nurse, then I might be worried. But secondly, it also found that the merger increased employment uh, and that's contrary to monopsony. The basic concept of monopsony is you reduce employment and that's what drives the labor wage down. So that's a highly ambiguous finding. Two other things about the data supporting the, the basic points we're talking about. One, again, if you go through the Treasury report, one of the things it points out is that labor market concentration in the U.S. has actually been falling um, over time in a sustained way. And that continues to be the case. So it is not the case that we're looking at an increase in labor market concentration over time, unless you look solely at the national level, which, of course, is not the level at which most people seek employment. But if you look at local labor markets where people actually seek employment, concentration has been declining. Um, and last point on this, even the studies and, and I'm mindful, uh, Marshall, the study that you did um, involving the relationship between concentration and wages. I, I think those were good studies. They're very worthwhile to look at, but they have a, an issue, which is that there's confounding variables, right? So when I look at the, your study, for example, it's a good study, but it also shows what, it, what I interpreted as basically saying is wages, employment, uh, wages and employment and job opportunities are very highly correlated with um, population. Right. So in essence, if you look at markets across the country where you have a whole lot of people, you got a lot of employers and a lot of jobs and wages are higher. And when you have very few people, you have very few employers, very few workers and wages are low. Right. So I don't know what's causing what. Right. Again, I don't doubt the fundamental model, but I think the data on the direct effect of concentration in existing markets as opposed to market power some other mechanisms and concentration are kind of ambiguous and hard to support large scale policy proposals from. Um, I guess to add a couple of things. Hold on, Dan. Should we have Ms. Professor Steinbaum do a a? Yeah, if, if you don't, know, I, will, I will briefly re respond to those points. Okay. So, okay. Uh, on on the, on the idea that um, uh, 
uh, increase in employment is inconsistent with the exercise of monopsony power. I just fundamentally don't agree with that. Um, that's consistent. That's what happens in some models of monopsony, like a Cournot monopsony uh, would have employment and wages going in the same direction. But not all models of monopsony uh, predict that outcome. Some can have a wage suppressing effect while increasing the uh, uh, employment or hours worked, however you want to measure quantity in the labor market. Um, and that's because basically when you have monopsony power on the part of employers, it can be wise for them to create a lot of jobs, basically low wage jobs um, that are very economical for them to fill. So you can get a model that predicts the proliferation of poor jobs, basically. Uh, and uh, I think that's a pretty good model, actually, to explain sort of broad scale macro trends. Um, on the question of whether concentration either has been increasing or decreasing over time, or uh, can be interpreted to reduce uh, wages and labor markets. Um, you know, I'm happy to litigate with this with you. I've been doing that for, <laughs> for five years. Um, I don't perceive that as being the, the sort of key point here about the pervasiveness or lack thereof of labor market power, but I'll uh, respond uh, uh, briefly to it. Um, so there's a question of how do you define labor markets? The papers that I've written that you're referring to uh, do so by means of the six digit cent, uh, uh, SOC uh, occupation, and that I presume is why that is the classification that appears in the proposed changes to the HSR filings. Um, you can get a lot more complicated than that. There's a, a new version of the excellent paper by Schubert, Stansbury, and Tasca uh, that look at the transition rates of, of workers in a given occupation to other occupations, or rather the, the non-transition rate, the rate at which they uh, uh, remain in their same occupation when they leave their job versus leave. Uh, uh, leave. You can redefine labor markets where you're basically, you know, if, if you have an occupation that has high mobility out, that kind of gets grouped with another occupation uh, versus occupations that don't have high mobility out there, they're on their own. Um, and what that paper shows is basically the increase in concentration in those sort of more um, uh, calibrated labor markets uh, it is more associated with a decline in, in wages. So that just says, we what we did with the SOC occupations. That's one way of defining labor markets. You could get a lot fancier with a lot better data. They're using uh, uh, resume histories, basically, uh, of um, occupations, and you'll get you know a potentially better labor market definition. But the basic point holds in the S the uh, labor markets that are defined by SOC occupations or six digit SOC occupations, I should say. Then finally, on the question of whether uh, concentration has gone up or down over time, um, I'm pretty agnostic on that point. Um, I think the force that says concentration has been going down over time in locally defined labor markets is basically uh, about the expansion of national chains into local markets, you know, despite, um, you know, the kind of stereotype that you hear about national change displacing local employers, the implication is basically the entry of national change doesn't fully displace all the local employers. So therefore, uh, concentration uh, uh, goes down when national chains enter. Um, it's not that I disbelieve that. I just think that there's other overwhelming evidence that labor market co uh, competition has been declining over time that doesn't stem from concentration. So I'm kind of surprised that you know a lot of the kind of question about has labor market power increased or decreased over time comes down to has concentration increased or decreased over time, since I would be the first to admit, and I, I would assume that's true of everyone on this call, that concentration isn't necessarily the only measure of uh, market power in any market. Um. I think it's right. I'm not sure that there's, um, I don't know. I don't think we have a prayer in hell of, of really going uh, through all of the literature here. Um, I think, you know, I mean, in terms of perfect competition, I don't know how many uh, IO economists or antitrust enforcers were really uh, uh, thinking in terms of perfect competition. And, you know, honestly, I mean, I'm no spring chicken. And as a child, I was getting lectures on labor econ from my dad, who was a very old, old school <laughs> labor economist. I mean, you know, Greg Lewis and a uh, very young Harry Johnson were, were dissertation supervisors. And in, in my first or second or third econ class, I said, started talking about perfect competition assumptions. And he just started laughing at me. Uh, I, I don't. And so and we we're talking about a previous century. Of course, there's been a lot of good research, a lot of interesting research. Um, I think some of it stronger than others and some, you know, you're talking about the strength of a paper, <laughs> there's, you know, there, there are a lot of areas here where you have very smart, thoughtful people writing very good papers with, I mean, there are some good data sources, there's some really terrible data sources and there are areas of the literature where these things really could use improvement. <laughs> 
you know, I will say I'm not in any position to share prior drafts of the of the Treasury report with anybody. But, you know, you can imagine not to blame Treasury, not to blame this administration. You can imagine a scenario where smart people in a department like Treasury would work on something, share drafts with staff from other agencies and you know, the second or third draft would be just a lot better and more nuanced than the final thing that's gone all the way up the chain and published. And I think, you know, the final report has lost some nuance that, that was there before in, in quite a few areas. And I really think it matters the stronger the intervention you want to tout, uh, whether it's a change to per se or something like a per se rule, the better the foundation I'd like to see and so, you know, you see some interesting things like with the non-compete rule. I mean, there's some, you know, there's some good work in there. There's some good literature summary. I know exactly who did it. Um, and, um, you know, that draft has been massaged a lot of, um, there are a lot of things even still in the draft that qualify a lot of the papers. And then, you know, you get the sort of high level comments where all the qualifications disappear. One interesting in that body of literature is, I mean, everybody knows that there are not just data problems in the sense that the data is imperfect. Of course, the data is imperfect, but you have certain kinds of problems running throughout the body of literature. And and one interesting, you know, it is odd. You have a, a, a good literature summary. It cites every single paper, as far as I can tell, that Evan Starr had written up until that point, Norman Bashara. Evan's a very smart and thoughtful guy. He's done a lot of good work. Uh, but one thing you see in one of his papers, the one paper of Starr and Bashar that is not cited there is a paper, it's not ancient, where they go through problems running through much of the prior literature. And it's not that there's a little problem here and a little problem there. It's sort of over-reliance on survey data throughout. And some of the survey data is terrible. Um, Evan, to his credit, has worked to improve it, first with a sort of fancy patched up convenience sample, but then by hounding the people at BLS and finally getting them to uh, include one question in the National Survey of Youth. It's going to produce some longitudinal data. They've got one paper already. But, you know, I mean, Evan's a smart, thoughtful guy. He wrote one question, they stuck it in there. There could be more questions. It's not validated. It's not tested against any direct measures. The FTC could be co collecting direct evidence if they want. Um, a whole bunch of papers. I, I could spend forever on this. There's some regulatory comments we filed, and I also got a paper coming out um, in a health policy and finance journal. There's a sort of interesting attempt to measure the enforceability of law changes and it's, I think, charitably a soft, fuzzy measure of nobody's exactly clear what the heck it is. Maybe less charitably, it's just a black box. There have been a lot of state law changes that can provide us opportunities to do event studies that don't use this because there have been much cleaner changes instead of having research assistants read published opinions and try and dream up what the heck kind of difference they made for some unspecified endpoint. Um, I think that, look, they're good papers and non-competes. I don't mean to suggest people couldn't have competitive concerns uh, about non-competes and, you know, or that I'm definitively right. I talk about some under uh, rule of reason in the healthcare space, um, but, but I think that, you know, it's the kind of thing where you want to make a sweeping rule, you might want to know more, even just how to pull apart average effects and what effects on whom. I yeah, mean, Dan, let me, let me turn to the enforceability point that you were mentioning, because I think that kind of runs into our next question for Bruce. Um, Bruce, um, Professor Steinbaum mentioned a few things in the literature, which um, you know, could all perceptually be a Section 5 violation under the new Section 5 policy statement that the FTC adopted. He mentioned um, economics, economic actors that are coerced, 
um, kind of per se condemnation of vertical restraints. Um, he mentioned, you know, kind of echoing some of the remarks that Chair Khan had made about um, mergers impacting working conditions and wages and schedules and those types of things should be viewed through an antitrust lens. So Bruce, the question for you is, given the standard in the new Section 5 policy statement, kind of where would one draw the line from an enforcement perspective, right? We've heard Professor Steinbaum talk about the research and the literature and the evidence, but as an enforcer, where would you draw the line in terms of legality and illegality from, from bringing actual cases on this? Sure, so Lana, and actually this goes directly to a point Marshall made. So, so Marshall made the point that why do we care about concentration, right? So you can make an argument about ambiguities in the literature on labor market concentration and effects of concentration on wages, right? Um, you know, I, parenthetically, just to answer that, I would say because in the merger context, the first thing you measure tends to be changes in concentration. So obviously, if that's the heuristic you're using for anti-competitive effects, then you're going to look for relationships between concentration and wage wage levels. But leaving that aside, to your point, Svetlana, that, that gets us into this question of conduct cases, right, and behavior and Section 5 enforcement outside of the context of mergers. And so Commissioner Bedoya just gave a really interesting speech, which I recommend reading. It's, it's a fascinating read um, and very well done. Uh, he gave it at GCR Live in Miami, um, and it's up on the FTC website, and it covers a lot of these questions with some, some very interesting kind of storytelling about mis misclassification specifically. Uh, and so, and what he talks about is by misclassification, what he's talking about is where employer X classifies certain types of what you might debate about being employees or not as independent contractors. And so the cost of employing those people is lower to that employer than the cost of employing somebody directly where you're paying benefits and, and so on and so forth. Right. And so the argument that, that Commissioner Bedoya is making is in essence, misclassification of workers not only reduces the compensation in all forms to those workers, but also it could be viewed as an unfair method of competition under Section 5 of the FTC Act because it creates an unfair competitive advantage. So if you can imagine if I've got a group of firms that are correctly, quote unquote, classifying workers as employees and incurring higher costs and they're competing with rivals that aren't, uh, then they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. So the question is, what does this mean and what can you really do with it? And this, to me, brings up something that um, Chair Muris of the FTC said a long time ago. He wrote a report that was called Everything Old is New Again. Um, and I was reading, I went back and read some of then-Chair Mike Perchuk's statements about the meaning of Section 5. And, and Perchuk wrote, among other things, quote, no response, this is in 1970s, he said, no responsive competition policy can neglect the social and environmental harms produced as unwelcome byproducts of the marketplace, resource depletion, energy waste, environmental contamination, worker alienation, the psychological and social consequences of, of marketing stimulated demands. And then he went further and said, you know, under section five, quote, can the FTC enjoin businessmen from employing illegal aliens? Could we enjoin a company from cheating on its taxes to gain a competitive advantage? Could we obtain an order requiring that an environmentalist be placed on the board of a company that repeatedly violates the pollution control laws? I leave you to ponder these and related possibilities. So this is not a new discussion, right? And, and Commissioner Bedoya is not unaware of this, and he points out, and, and nor is the FTC, right? And, and so Commissioner Bedoya in his speech pointed out that, well, in our Section 5 statement that we recently issued, we actually say um, that we're not just talking about legal violations that impose cost advantages or disadvantages. So it's gotta be something more than that. Um, but then he goes on and says, but I still think misclassification can be a quote unquote method of competition that lets law-breaking employers win business from honest ones. And therefore his argument is, the FTC can prohibit misclassification as an unfair method of competition under Section 5 of the FTC Act. I think that this, I, I, I think that it's useful that Commissioner Bedoya and the FTC recognize that the FTC Act does not turn the FTC into the super regulator of everything in the United States, right? Because ultimately, 
compliance with any law or regulation or non-compliance with any law or regulation could create a competitive advantage or disadvantage. There's no way to, there's no limiting principle that you can apply to that. What I'm struggling with is how to draw the line. You know, Commissioner Bedoya says there's a line and this is on one side of it and other things are on the other, but he doesn't tell me how I should draw that line. Like I can't discern the principle that he's using to separate misclassification from say hiring illegal aliens as employees as Mike Perchuk talked about in the 1970s. Um, I have in the past talked a little bit about using antitrust law, monopolization law in the context of conduct and thinking about what kind of conduct is anti-competitive, right? Is it, you know, what, when we talk about competition on the merits versus anti-competitive behavior, or we talk about unfair competition versus fair competition, there's gotta be some metric other than I know it when I see it. And I think the real difficulty here for the FTC or for anybody attempting to enforce these laws is figuring out what is a principle which would identify a type of behavior that would be anti-competitive or an unfair method of competition. I would suggest that one thing you could think about would be behavior that's unambiguously welfare reducing, right? And so in, for example, torts, right, in the form of inflicting physical harm, destroying people's factories, you could easily say those are welfare reducing. Um, false advertising is welfare reducing on net. There's no pro-competitive benefit of it, but it's a little bit difficult to think about with classification or misclassification of employees. I just don't know. I haven't thought enough or looked into the research to know whether I could describe that as welfare reducing in aggregate. But I do think some principle would have to be articulated here in order to figure out how you draw the line that separates some kinds of conduct from any kind of violation of any law. I think one thing to think about, though, with a test like that, Bruce, is how do you weigh the welfare of different constituencies, right? I mean, the employees versus the business versus the consumers. When I was, I actually had the pleasure of being at GCR and watching that speech as well. And I thought that maybe one clear area is what's the business rationale that's actually adopted? What are the contemporaneous business records show about why a business is misclassifying workers or why is it not, you know, are they doing it consciously to get a competitive advantage? And in that way, they're viewing it as a method of competition as opposed to just another business practice or failure to do something correctly uh, in compliance with the law. I mean, that seems like if there were gonna be a core sort of set of types of instances that the FTC might pursue, that would be a starting point. All right, I'm gonna go to Maureen first, yeah. and then, um, cause I wanna get Jim in here. He's been waiting patiently to talk about the labor lawyer perspective. So I wanna get him okay. here, but Maureen, I'll go to you next. Thank you, I'll just touch on this really briefly. You know, and Bruce, you mentioned principle and, you know, we're talking, you know, brings up the idea of an intelligible principle, certainly, and then the unfair method of competition policy statement, which a lot of this debate or these discussions are being grounded in, really raises this, I think, really important issue of the major questions doctrine as, um, you know, can the FTC as a constitutional matter, the separation of powers matter, you know, kind of step into all of these areas based on the you know, kind of vague unfair methods of competition authority. And while, you know, you talked about um, Percha, um, you know, it raised concerns back then, but we have a court um, that has embraced, I think, a much um, more uh, searching question of can the agency, which right now is just operating with, you know, three commissioners from the same party, take on these sweeping, these sweeping powers. And if they pair that with rulemaking, you almost end up with a three-person legislature. Um, so I think that, you know, looking at these things, you also have to keep in mind kind of the those kinds of um, due process, separation of powers, yeah. constitutional issues. Sorry, Svetlana, I have to respond to that because I think there is no doubt that this is within the agency's power. Um, I thought the best part of the Bedoya speech was the reference to uh, Peckham's decision in Trans-Missouri Freight saying that the competitive harm in here is in the removal of independent decision-making power. It's a long-standing principle in antitrust law, no sense in which the agency is uh, uh, transgressing its boundaries, and it is not the standard that Bruce just articulated. I don't think that a welfare-reducing standard is administrable at all. I think the 
uh, uh, standard should be, does the misclassification reduce uh, uh, independent source of decision-making power? That is where the harm to competition lies. And I think that that is why the idea of misclassification of a of, of an economic employee as an independent contractor says, well, you're basically exercising control over the boundaries of the firm that that uh, reduces the uh, uh, competition because it's it, it's controlling an agent that should be independent. All right. I want to get Bruce, uh, Jim's opinion on that because that seems like a labor question. But Dan, one minute and then we have to turn to Jim because he's been waiting for 54 minutes. Well, Go ahead, yeah, Dan. we want to hear from Jim. I mean, the That's one minute thing me. is two pieces. We don't know what the bounds of section uh, uh, five are in this space. Everyone agrees a tiny on a tiny bit of extension uh, past the the antitrust laws. Um, the commission released a very very bold restatement of section five, and who the heck knows? It's not been tested in the uh, uh, courts at all. You know, on you know authority in the subject matter, maybe sure, but <laughs> it's it's a very weird. Maybe it's because there are no litigators sitting on the commission right now, but the prologue to the non-compete NPRM seems to have been written to beg the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court to look at an, uh, a non-compete rule through the lens of the major questions doctrine. What they would say, what's the right answer? I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to stop. It looks like they wanted that to be tried. All right, Jim, back to the, you. I, yes, you get, I know the, answer. The, you get the last right. 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I'm not even going to take have that. I a lot of questions for you, Jim. Is this sure. giving you concern from a, a labor perspective in terms of wages, working conditions, kind of this inherent the allegation of inherent power imbalance and how that is necessarily an antitrust issue? Tell us, I, tell us your thoughts, Jim. Sure. I mean, I think from my perspective, now, if, if they want to take that position by way of an enforcement action, that may be one thing. But if the agency wants to do rulemaking in this area, I, I think looking at section, uh, sections five and six, it is very difficult to read that as permitting them. So before we get to the constitutional issue of major question, which I do think is a very legitimate question, uh, it's very difficult to read section, any reading of section five and six to come up with the authority for the agency to issue rules on the unfair method of competition side, obviously on the deceptive acts and practices, there's an extensive, you know, regulatory scheme for what they can do there. I would say that the absence of that on the unfair competition side strongly counsels to me that they're they're beyond their statutory authority in doing this. I also do agree with Maureen that once we get in, if we get past that, I do think we have you know, pretty significant major question, you know, major questions doctrine concern. And, you know, it's fashionable right now. Everything's a major question. But, you know, here is one where when I talk about this with folks, I say it's, it's not like this is a relative, you know, non-competes are not a relatively new development. I mean, they're quite literally older than the United States itself. We brought them over from the common law in England. And for them to have gone on for hundred, literally hundreds of years, not having been raised, you know, not having been raised as an issue in, by the FTC in the last however many it's been, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's a fairly a, a fairly strong reversal of position and when you look at major questions issues one of the things they'll always look at is you know where an agency suddenly after years and years purports to find the authority to regulate something that up until now it never suggested it had the authority to regulate that to me suggests you know, that is that is when it's at the you know the ebb of its power is is my opinion so yeah, that's a lot I'm, I'm honored and flattered to be among the professors and the economists here today because i can tell you having done labor and employment law for you know more than 25 years now i, I don't know that before last year or the year before that i'd spend much time even looking at the ftc i mean they really in this space when it gets to particularly the regulation of you know individual employees and the individual you know their relationship with their employer uh, you know, this is to me fairly novel, but I do I defer to the experts in terms of what that means is, you know, more broadly and sort of how the agency might bring it as, you know, as an enforcement matter. Because to my knowledge, really the first step they took here was might have been January fourth of last year, or maybe it was the fifth. Said, oh, you know, we are now we are settled three complaints about non competition agreements. The next day, quite literally the next day, so I think it was the fourth and then the fifth. You know, with that 24 hours of experience, they then held themselves out to be, you know, subject area, you know, subject matter experts on the field of non-compete. So 
from my perspective, it'll be interesting to see what rule they come down with. Um, I don't know that they they can draw a limiting principle. And I will say, you know, looking at it through a purely political litigator's angle, I, because there is such a concern that if allowed to regulate in this area in this way and rule make, you know, where is the FTC going to go next? I suspect even the most modest you know, and, and non-compete rule that everyone on this call would agree is, you know, seems reasonable, is not going to, you know, tr dramatically upset anything. Uh, I suspect that's going to be subject to challenge, simply put on the principle thing. All right. So we are um, at, at time, but I just want to throw out one last question in terms of counseling clients in this area, whether labor clients or antitrust clients, whether mergers or or, or otherwise, kind of what are what are some kind of le learning lessons or key takeaways in navigating kind of the labor antitrust uh, dimensions going forward in this administration? Any kind of last words from anyone on, on the subject? I, I, I will just say the, this administration in particular, they have taken, and I, I think I've done an admirable job, particularly if, you, you know, if you're in line with what they think, um, a whole of government approach that really is you know somewhat unprecedented. I mean, in the past, we've seen, oh, there's a memorandum of understanding, or maybe, you know, sister agencies will share some data, share some information about investigations. But to you, again, to use the issue of non-competes, you have the FTC in it, uh, the National Labor Relations Board, and the General Counsel of the NLRB has is, is been agitating that these are violations of the National Labor Relations Act. Again, a law that's been on the books for 90 some years, and this has never been an, an argument that's really been presented. So with respect to this administration, they have all of their boats rowing in the same direction. Uh, if you like that direction, you give them credit. If you don't like that direction, you do what I do and make money suing them. All right, anyone else? I think it's just sort of be prepared that you might get these kind of questions and that if the HSR rule goes through as proposed, you're going to have to provide a lot more information and be prepared uh, to, to do that and also take a hard look. If you have non-competes, why do you have them? Do you still need them? Is there something less restrictive that would um, protect your interests in the way that you're trying to protect them? Because the states are moving a lot on non-compete issues as well. All righty. Well, we are at time. So I wanted to thank the panelists again for your generosity of time and being here and preparing with us. It's really great to have your expertise. Um, and thank you to Emily and the Federalist Society for hosting us today. On behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you all for joining us for this great discussion today. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and you are adjourned. Mm -hmm.